In this lecture, we look at neoliberalism, which begins in the 1970s, uh, and I'll argue will come to a culmination or even an end in 2009. To understand neoliberalism, we have to understand that the old liberalism imploded on itself at the end of the 60s and in the early 70s. And this was because of the big fiscal policy of the Johnson administration and the old liberals, exacerbated by the radicals' understanding of social regulation. The crisis of liberalism, I think, can best be understood uh, in the term the welfare warfare state that characterized accurately LBJ's administration. Those who liked LBJ would talk about uh, a kind of tragedy that LBJ, because he wanted to uh, pay vast sums for the war in Vietnam, had sacrificed the domestic programs in the great society that would have made him a successful president. But to say that is to misunderstand liberalism, that the key components of liberalism combined big fiscal policy, meaning government spending and taxation, uh, with uh, a, a war against communism abroad, uh, and both characterized uh, the liberals. Neoliberalism proceeds out of what I like to call the Nixon transition. In many ways, Nixon was the last liberal uh, instituting uh, price controls, uh, and in many ways, the first neoliberal when he removes the dollar from the gold standard. Nixon also approved much of the social regulation uh, and the new administrative agencies uh, were vast. They were giving far-reaching power to regulate across uh, industries in the country. Here particularly, the, the Environmental Protection Agency and OSHA would pass the most uh, wide-ranging and far-reaching regulations. There were 11 consumer protection laws that were passed in the New Deal. There were 62 that were passed from 1960 to 1978. There were five worker safety laws passed during the New Deal, and 21 laws were passed in this period of social regulation. In 1972, the EPA expanded to more than 50 laboratories with 2,000 experts in 60 different fields. So we have this vast growth in bureaucracy. Uh, some of the new agencies I've already mentioned, the EEOC, the EPA, OSHA, the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Uh, and with these vast regulations, they would make corporations pay for what they called externalities the size of bureaucracy explodes. From 1970 to 1977, full-time positions in federal regulatory agencies grew from 28,000 to 81,000 jobs. Uh, when there were federal hiring freezes, then the federal government would farm out jobs to state and local governments. Personnel there increased some 40% or some 4 million hires. From 1936 to 1977, the pages of federal regulations grew from 2,599 to 65,603. Uh, those, that number of pages sextupled from 1969 to 1974, and it tripled in the 1970s. These agencies ex exacted ongoing relief from large corporations, straining both the economy and the old liberal relations with industry. The new costs for businesses were uncertain in scale, timing, and compliance, and blocked smaller firms from the market. Economists estimated that the new social regulation was responsible for 16 to 30 percent of industrial productivity slowdown in the 1970s. Moreover, the social radicalism in the cities uh, hurt industry within the cities. Cities experienced what was called white flight, largely because of the riots and because of the unfriendly business regulations that had been passed. In what was called tin cup urbanism, radical mayors organized inner city blacks for welfare in what was called the new property. They pushed out middle class whites and blacks in industries which fled to the suburbs. As we've already seen, uh, white middle class parents did not want their children exposed to the violence that they would face in inner city schools. And so because of the vast spending of the late 1960s and into the 70s, the great inflation rolls in. We call this stagflation today, meaning a stagnating economy, an economic slowdown, and added to that were very high levels of inflation. In 1971, Nixon implemented price controls and finally resorted to ending the convertibility of the dollar, which in what was called the gold pool was convertible for $35 an ounce. When the British foreign minister asked for a redemption of large sums of dollars in gold, 
Nixon conferred with his advisors and decided to remove the dollar from the gold standard, which had been one of the core tenets of the Bretton Woods system of 1944. And this officially ends what we'd call the period of liberalism. To secure the dollar as the world's reserve currency, the United States worked with oil producing nations to create what we call the petrodollar. This means it would give billions of dollars in aid to countries like Saudi Arabia if they would agree to exclusively price their oil in dollars. And the United States made arrangements with all the oil producing countries uh, by the mid 70s. This also meant that oil importing countries would need the dollar to purchase oil. And so it helped to create a vast demand for, for the dollar, which had already existed. Oil importing countries now had to keep very large dollar reserves and would take on large amounts of debt. Neoliberalism was born of a consensus of educated Americans that the big fiscal policy of the 1960s was not working. Probably the most effective critique was that of Milton Friedman, who warned of the large inflation that was going to ensue as the result of the spending of the Great Society in the 1960s, and he was proved right. Kevin Phillips in 1968 had predicted in his book, The Emerging Republican Majority, that there would be a surge of Republican voters, those who were moving to the West and to the Sun Belt states. And so there would be a challenge to the Democratic hold on the Congress. Uh, and his prediction largely proved correct. Uh, for example, in Richard Nixon's landslide election, there are two neoliberal thinkers that I think best exemplify the neoliberal consensus. We often think of them as antithetical to one another. The first is John Rawls, whose theory of justice appeared in 1971. And the second is Milton Friedman, who became famous in the 1960s and the 1970s with his videos and essays uh, that argued for the right to choose. But both of them have more in common than we usually think. So let's briefly discuss both of them. Rawls' theory of justice proceeded from his desire to provide a political philosophy that would unify what he saw as to be the divided groups in American and Western society. He sought a new theory of justice, and in a way he would try to salvage elements of the older liberalism, but combine it with some of the new elements that emerged from the 1960s, such as the sexual revolution, as well as the new identity groups. Rawls argued that we can't agree on any fundamental good in our society. Uh, philosophy couldn't uncover these absolute truths that resorted to metaphysical postulates. And so he argued what we can agree on is a certain theory of justice that would be procedural in nature. We could agree on certain rules of the game. And he wanted to provide it, uh, a hypothetical, uh, a heuristic that would try to lead us to his own understanding of what a just society would look like. He concocts this story, uh, and it's in his own spin on the old social contract theory of an original position. Rawls' argument is basically this. Let's say you are to represent somebody who's going to have a place in a society that has not yet been constructed. You are behind a veil of ignorance. This is a way to try to remove bias. Rawls would argue that if you're dealing not just with a, a pure social contract, meaning uh, ahistorical, but an actual historical social contract, one that actually happens, that you're dealing with the actual biases that those who participate in it have at the time. And so Rawls wants us to represent uh, these individuals for a new society. And he says, what kind of a society would you want to live in, in representing this other person who has all kinds of ideals that maybe you don't share, but what kind of a society would be best for them? Rawls concluded that uh, if you didn't know how wealthy you would be, and he focuses on wealth, if you didn't know how wealthy you would be, and uh, wealth may be present um, in other ways. For example, uh, if you are uh, African American or if you are a female in this other society, uh, you may not have the same benefits uh, that others would have in this society. So what kind of a society would you want to live in? Rawls uses this heuristic of the original position and the veil of ignorance to suggest that we would choose a certain, he called it lexical order of basic goods in our society. The first was basic liberties. We would all choose to have the freedoms we usually trace to the Bill of Rights. Freedom of conscience, freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of association, and these kinds of things. We can all agree on those, and those would uh, have first place in our hierarchy or ranking of goods. The second, he says, uh, in this hierarchy of goods, uh, would be uh, reward according to merit. Uh, all offices would be open to anyone, uh, and they would receive their positions based upon excellence. But then he adds the difference principle. The difference principle is 
Rawls recognition that there may be some who, because of the groups that they are in, uh, may not have equal opportunities as others in society. Obviously, here he's thinking about uh, segregation and civil rights, or he uh, is talking about the labor union movement. And so Rawls argues that there can be unequal treatment under the law insofar as that unequal treatment serves to benefit the most disadvantaged or the least among us in society. Rawls did not include this in his book, but what he obviously had in mind, uh, and this was shared by others who knew him, is he had in mind the affirmative action regime. Uh, in Rawls' mind, you had those who were not born into a situation of no fault of their own of equal opportunity. And so we needed to treat people differently under the law to elevate them to this equal playing field for equal opportunity, after which there would be individual competition. Rawls' understanding would be shared by uh, an economist named Lester Thoreau, who wrote a book called The Zero-Sum Society. The thesis of The Zero-Sum Society is, is that you can't simply tax industry to pay for the entitlements of a welfare state. Rather, you need to encourage innovation, uh, you need investment in the economy, and economic growth. And then you would have the the general pot, or you would have the funds to pay for the kinds of entitlement programs uh, that would help the least among us and those who were unfortunate. And here you see a change from the old liberals to the neoliberals. They argued that you uh, needed the free market, you needed deregulation, and only then could you balance the free market profits with welfare, uh, a security state, a safety net, uh, and environmentalism. When we look at Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman had warned that the big fiscal policy, again, government taxation and spending, uh, would result in inflation. He argued that uh, we needed to prioritize monetary policy over fiscal policy. The government needed to be concerned with how many dollars it was printing. And so the word neoliberal uh, is often traced not just to Rawls' attempt to salvage liberalism, but Milton Friedman and other free market economists appealed to what they called classical liberalism. Uh, and here they were referring to theories from the 19th century or going all the way back to Adam Smith in the 18th century, uh, that the free market would self-regulate to correct for prices and for the right number of goods, uh, that there were certain things that were unknowable by experts in their attempt to manage the economy, and that led to a government slowdown, disincentives for business to compete with one another uh, and to produce, and thereby create jobs. And so Milton Friedman opposed what he called liberalism or classical liberalism to what was called Keynesianism. And what he meant by that was the new economics of the 1960s uh, that went by the general term Keynesianism, whether that was accurate or not. Milton Friedman's society would focus on uh, what we now call homo economicus, and Rawls did the same. Uh, the idea is that we would look at rationally choosing individuals and see that they would make choices for their own individual goods. Milton Friedman had argued that if you allow maximum freedom for individuals instead of state intervention, uh, that ultimately uh, you would find a natural harmony in a society, and individuals, by benefiting themselves, would indirectly benefit others around them in the society. For example, an individual who has the incentive to create profits and wealth for himself uh, will indirectly create wealth for others. It will trickle down to them in the form of jobs uh, and lower prices with greater production. And so Milton Friedman argued that the central bank must privilege anti-inflationary policies over the older fiscal policies, such as taxation and redistribution. Government itself, according to Friedman, had to become competitive. He said what was needed was deregulation, free trade, and the privatization of state enterprises. Friedman also had influence in foreign policy. Many of the, quote, Chicago boys, speaking of the Chicago School of Economics, went down to countries like Argentina, uh, where they influenced many of the politics in those countries. For example, to get poorer countries to privatize, which essentially was to sell state-owned assets to uh, Western investors. How did this influence practical politics? What we see is that Friedman was very influential uh, on presidents like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher. Both Republicans and Democrats, young professionals, would challenge the old liberal view of taxation and spending. On the Democratic side, we find deregulation taking place under the Carter administration. Many of those who follow the Chicago School of Economics, professional economists, will get jobs in agencies themselves, and they begin to challenge many of the radicals' views of regulation of large industry. Uh, in, in an incredible moment, we find the ICC regulating itself out of business, and so the ICC was disbanded. We find a radical change that takes place in the Civil Aeronautics Board, where again, it simply disbanded itself 
uh, and its key elements of regulation were turned to the Department of Transportation. Within the Democratic Party, young politicians call themselves neoliberal. There's a wonderful article in 1982 Esquire magazine called The Neoliberal Club, and it features the young Democratic politicians, uh, many of them going back to the Watergate babies of 1974, and they explicitly distanced themselves from the big fiscal policies of the 1960s. They said they were not, quote, bleeding heart liberals. Some of the names in that piece uh, were Paul Songus, Bill Bradley, Tim Wirth, uh, the new star Gary Hart, uh, often included in this group were Bill Clinton and Al Gore. These were young politicians at the time, and they wanted to celebrate free market principles and deregulation to encourage business growth. They'd seen the slowdowns in the 1970s, and then they could justify the government spending to take care of the least among us. Ronald Reagan fits nicely within this group of presidents we call neoliberal presidents. He argued that the source of stagflation had been government itself. And thus what was needed was a new federalism and deregulation. Reagan represented what in the Republican Party was called fusionism. This was the brainchild of Frank Meyer, who was part of the National Review crowd, uh, which in the 1950s and the 1960s argued that the way to bring back conservatism within the Republican Party uh, was to sacrifice those that it considered to be the militant right, the John Birchers, on the one hand, but on the other hand, to try to piece together different conservative schools of thought in economics, uh, but also in, in uh, social and moral issues, was the libertarian school of thought, uh, and added to this the neoconservative school of thought. The U.S. government should pay a, a large amount of money to increase defense spending to defeat the Soviet Union in the Cold War. And finally, there were the traditionalists, uh, those on the evangelical right, the religious right, who had seen so many of their beliefs come under assault in the 1960s and in the 1970s. Uh, and they looked to issues like abortion and the gay liberation movement. Interestingly enough, Kevin Phillips, the same one who predicted the, the emerging Republican majority, warned in 1982 that these groups had very little in common. Uh, in a book he called Post-Conservatism, he said that the intellectual leaders of the Republican Party actually have little in common with their base, and their base thinks they're going to get something different out of the policies of the Republican Party. Ten years later, we would see the rise of Ross Perot and a populist movement against those intellectual schools of thought. So what were Reagan's policies? Well, the first major policy was cutting taxes. And Reagan, looking to what's called the Laffer Curve, argued that if you reduced the amount of taxes that particularly the wealthy had to pay, instead of squirreling away their money in places where it would not be subjected to taxation, they would actually pay the taxes. And if you provided incentives for economic growth, the pool of taxes would grow itself. And so Reagan had argued that economic growth would indeed pay for the entitlements, which he uh, argued should be scaled back, although very little of that happened uh, in his administration. And so unlike Jimmy Carter, who argued that the government should cut entitlement spending and also cut taxes to spur economic growth, Reagan argued that if you cut taxes, you could actually increase deficit spending because growth in the economy would be able to pay for those deficits. What it meant was is that the federal debt exploded under Ronald Reagan. In 1981, it was $965 billion. In 1989, it was $2.74 trillion. In 1993, it had grown to $4.5 trillion. And the U.S. government would run deficits in the next 34 out of 38 years. Reagan was also a champion of, of deregulation. One of the ways that he would control the spending and the regulation in the agencies is through the Office of Management and the Budget, which is in the Executive Office of the President. And there, Reagan, by appointing the director of the OMB, could control or check the proposals of spending and budgets that were coming from those different agencies. One of the most important changes in the Reagan administration uh, was a change in antitrust prosecutions. Antitrust had been around a long time in the common law, in the state laws in the 19th century, and then in federal law with the 1890 Sherman Antitrust Act. Antitrust prosecutions continued all the way up through the 1960s with very little challenge. But because of the ideas of Milton Friedman, Robert Bork, and Alan Greenspan, who argued that trusts were very helpful in producing a large amount of goods and lowering consumer prices, uh, Reagan appointed those into the Department of Justice uh, who would scale back the antitrust cases and prosecutions. Uh, many economists who were followers of Friedman were placed into the antitrust division. Uh, and there, without a single change in the law, 
uh, the antitrust division changed the criteria by which it would prosecute trust. The basic consideration was, uh, were trusts good for the consumer? Were they lowering consumer prices? Which is, very, which is very different from the consideration of market share. What we see beginning in Reagan's administration and continuing all the way up to the present is the formation of monopolies in almost every major market. Reagan was also controversial when it came to his appeals to the religious right. Reagan himself had been a libertarian on issues of abortion or no-fault divorce. Uh, those were both laws he'd helped to pass as governor of California. However, he knew, and this uh, came with his challenge to Gerald Ford within the Republican Party, he knew that there was a key constituency of Christians and particularly evangelicals and fundamentalists that he should appeal to. And so Reagan, seeing how the evangelicals had responded negatively uh, to uh, Betty Ford's claim that she wouldn't be disturbed. She found out her daughter smoked marijuana or had premarital sex. Reagan tacked to the right, and Reagan then began to appeal to the religious right on these claims of gay liberation and abortion. Uh, he had the support of Jerry Falwell and others in that community. There's a real question as to how successful Reagan was in achieving victories for any of these religious conservatives or any of these traditionalists. Reagan also had a dramatic impact in U.S. involvement in global trade. He argued for global free trade. He supported the 1986 meetings for the Uruguay Round of GATT, which was the basis for greater global free trade, as we'll see during the Clinton administration. While Reagan supported tariffs to secure some U.S. industries, Harley-Davidson motorcycles is, is the famous example, um, that wasn't representative of Reagan's policies. He very much was in favor of outsourcing. When it came to Reagan's foreign policy, he embraced uh, neoconservatism, uh, and this was a recognition of the need of the United States to have a very strong defense so that it can challenge the Soviet Union around the world. The United States en engaged in free trade with allies against the Soviet Union, uh, and in Reagan's early policy, it would escalate and then win the Cold War. And Reagan was very successful in convincing the Soviets that they could not win an arms race against the United States. The United States would remain interventionist, but do so in a different way. Uh, it would use the World Bank and the IMF to give large loans to countries in what was called the Global South that had been irresponsible with their currency policies and their fiscal spending. And with these large loans, there would be high interest payments by which we could control the politics and the economic decisions made in the Global South. In what were called structural adjustment programs, uh, these institutions would loan countries money with strings attached to make sure that investors uh, could receive the profits of their investment. Reagan also had a profound influence in the area of immigration. In the 1970s, he had encouraged more open borders. He had said, why are we opposed to bringing in immigrants that will do jobs that Americans won't do? Here he's referring to apple pickers. But Reagan also signed the Simpson-Mazzoli Act of 1986. This was a key bill. This naturalized almost three million illegal immigrants. On the one hand, on the other hand, it included no provisions that would punish businesses for hiring illegals. That was inserted by the civil rights slash business lobby. So while Americans were opposed to illegal immigration and wanted to find an enforcement of the immigration laws on the books, this was opposed by lobbyists working within the administration. And so the naturalization of three million illegals simply brought three million more illegals. In a quite remarkable essay by the Wall Street Journal in the mid-80s, they argued that the solution to economic growth would be a five-word constitutional amendment, there shall be open borders. There was also uh, the propaganda uh, that circulated throughout America towards the end of the 80s that there was a shortage of skilled labor, and this was in the STEM fields. These are the fields where Americans had gone to school for years. Uh, and with the argument that there was a shortage of skilled labor, the United States would introduce the H-1B visas to import skilled workers and undercut the wages of those STEM workers who'd been educated in the United States. Bill Clinton was called a radical by many conservatives and Republicans in the 1990s, uh, but rather Bill Clinton should be understood as a neoliberal. Bill Clinton had moved to the middle. Uh, after his election. This was Dick Morris' strategy called triangulation. Uh, he was able to capture uh, many of those whites who had voted Republican by appealing to common sense principles. Bill Clinton had risen uh, to the presidency uh, following the recession under George Herbert Walker Bush and the SNL crisis, where the federal government had bailed out the SNLs, costing taxpayers $100 billion. Also, the fall of the USSR had taken communism off the table. And so the Democrats couldn't be punished by the public perception they were often squishy on defense issues.
Bill Clinton argued remarkably, quote, the era of big government is over. He argued for a third way uh, between leftism and those on the right who embrace simply free market policies. Clinton, remarkably, with the help of Republicans, balanced the budget. He further deregulated finance. He engaged in welfare reform to cut back on welfare benefits or the amount of time that people could receive welfare benefits. Bill Clinton issued or ushered in a new round of tax cuts. Bill Clinton got tough on crime. In what was called the sister soldier moment, Clinton was able to appeal to uh, middle-class Americans. Following the 1992 LA riots, sister soldier had said, why don't blacks, instead of killing each other, take two weeks off and kill whites for a change? And Bill Clinton, right in front of Jesse Jackson, condemned that kind of rhetoric that he said led to hostility and division between Americans. But her comments before and after Los Angeles were filled with the kind of hatred that you do not honor today and tonight. And so Bill Clinton presides over the era of peak globalization. The United States enters into an agreement with Mexico and Canada in NAFTA. It also ushers China into the World Trade Organization, which would promote free trade policies, and China enters in 2001. Under Bill Clinton, we see the Silicon Valley boom. Asian nations pegged their currencies to the dollar, began to buy U.S. bonds and tech stocks in what would be the formation of the dot-com bubble at the end of the 1990s. It was, for many thinkers, the end of history, this era of globalization. They argued that neoliberalism was the final political philosophy. It meant that there would be limited government and there would be free markets. Uh, and that this was the most successful form of political order ever devised, and that there would be nothing that would supersede it. Uh, thinkers who uh, promised this were Francis Fukuyama, who talked about the end of history. He argued that, that the future of the world would consist of peacefully trading liberal democracies that were able to successfully channel their citizens' aggression towards peaceful ends. Thomas Friedman argued that the world is flat, what this meant was is the transnational corporations and global investors had broken down all national sovereign boundaries and that they would take their money and their investments only to uh, friendly central banks. Countries that had large amounts of regulation or that sought to punish investors would watch this electric herd stampede to other countries and they would find their wealth and their power decrease. And so political orders are really subjected to these economic measures. Friedman argued that there were the rules of the golden straitjacket. Remarkably, he argued that the era of large bureaucracy was over and that if countries violated these rules of free trade, they would find themselves behind uh, in investment and in economic growth. Friedman also argued in his book, The Lexus and the Olive Tree, uh, that global free trade uh, also depended upon the hidden fist, not just the hidden hand. This meant that U.S. military might was necessary to secure these global institutions. Clinton had used NATO for peacekeeping forces, not just for the protection of U.S. sovereignty or U.S. interests. With the neoliberal rise of global finance and transnational corporations in the 1990s, we see the rise of what were called global cities, London, Tokyo, New York, and a new kind of a culture that rose up in these cities. They were often called the bourgeois bohemians. Uh, earlier in the 80s, they had been called the yuppies, the young urban professionals. David Brooks had said uh, that these bourgeois bohemians were combining uh, the neoliberal economics with a new kind of social justice and concerns for social justice. He said that they were a new meritocracy and he could see no end to their rule. The last neoliberal president we discuss here is George W. Bush. George W. Bush would continue the policies of, of Bill Clinton, but he would also introduce a seedier side of neoliberalism and he would introduce what I'll argue is its collapse in legitimacy. From 2000 to 2010, the U.S. outsourced 30% of its manufacturers. Uh, this was disguised by the fact that the numbers reported for output were driven by one variable, and that's value added in computers. From 2001 to 2003, the trade deficit rose 37%. What accompanied this is what Charles Murray called coming apart. That meant in American society, the middle class had not received an increase in real wages since the 1970s. And the U.S. witnessed a vast divide that was created by the cosmopolitans in the cities and the elites that ran the country and the old rural populations in the old middle class. So in the 1990s outsourcing, the United States, because of corporate monopolies, becomes increasingly dependent on other nations like China. Despite the fact that the U.S. spends more on defense than any other nation, its contractors, focusing on creating monopolies, use the money to outsource technology and production to China which steals the technology 
surpassing the U.S. in 5G technology and hypersonic missiles. The U.S. imports aluminum from China for its aircraft carriers and is losing its submarine fleet. Because it has outsourced production of high-quality fasteners and castings, it cannot build as many ships per year as it retires. The U.S. now depends completely, 100%, on nations like China for the materials, like specialty chemicals, for its advanced weapons systems. In immigration, Americans became very angry with neoliberal policy. Uh, those who were Democrats, John B. Judas, Roy Teixeira, Paul Starr, in the late 90s had celebrated the demographic decline of the old white populations, very clearly. Clinton, at his uh, Portland State Address, had talked about how whites would become a minority and the progressive whites in Portland applauded the decline of whites in Ohio. Probably most importantly uh, were George W. Bush's wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, which became the U.S.'s longest and most expensive wars to very little real gain. This is because George W. Bush, in neoliberal fashion, believed with those who surrounded them, they called them the Vulcans, Condi Rice, Colin Powell, uh, that you could simply create democracies in other countries that had, had different cultures for thousands of years. They employed the same counterinsurgency tactics that had been applied in Vietnam and to the same failed end. Not only did Bush decide that we would try to introduce democracy to Iraq, he introduced through the Patriot Act a new surveillance state. For the first time, the, the encryption policies that had been used by the NSA were removed and federal intelligence agencies are spying directly on U.S. citizens. What also became evident was the failure of what in academia had been called democratic peace theory, something that Fukuyama uh, had agreed with. It was the idea that Western liberal democracies don't fight, and so the U.S. had an interest in promoting liberal democracy all around the world. However, some of the countries that the United States was trading with, namely China, had adopted the U.S. economic policies, but none of their democracy. And so it didn't adopt any of the freedoms that U.S. citizens thought would accompany the free market policies that they had endorsed. All the while, in the United States, citizens were finding their own freedoms eroded. So as a result of George W. Bush's policies leading into the Great Recession, we find that all the conservative gods are dead as part of the neoliberal order. Libertarianism, neoconservatism, the failure to try to create democracies abroad. Would it become obvious by 2008 is that all of the U.S. flag-waving about how it was going to bring freedom and democracy to the world was an obvious failure, that we had invaded Iraq on a lie, the idea that they had weapons of mass destruction. The promise that we could turn Iraq into a democracy was a sham. All of the costly spending projects that had been concocted by Ivy League graduates, they were called Yale, Male, and Pale, Stupid ideas, organic chicken farms in Iraq, things like translating Tom Sawyer into Arabic. These are many of the programs that they introduced that were obvious failures abroad. In the 2008 Great Recession, what Americans saw was all those free market policies had been lies, basically. They saw under George W. Bush the largest deficits the United States had seen up until that time. George W. Bush signed, and we'll see why later, George W. Bush signed Medicare Part D, probably one of the most fiscally irresponsible programs the U.S. had seen since the 1960s. We'll get into why that's the case when we get into modern monetary theory in the next lecture. Americans had seen that all the Republicans' appeals to the Constitution and free market principles uh, were a facade. And all of those who had celebrated free markets were the first to turn their backs on those principles when it came time to bailing out the largest banks and corporations all the while uh, holding the feet of America's mortgage payers to the fire. When it came time to being fiscally responsible, they saw George W. Bush and the Republicans advocating massive amounts of spending to bail out these large institutions to prevent a, a global recession. So uh, those gods, I would argue, were dead. Uh, intelligent young conservatives in 2008 all voted for Ron Paul and the ones that I saw. They didn't vote for George W. Bush. They were tired uh, in speaking to them, many of them, they were the first to say, I'm done with the Republican Party. This happens pretty early in 2008. Uh, it was the idea of, I know what John McCain and I know what Mitt Romney, these types of conservatives, I know what they're going to do. They're going to support the open borders, free trade, and military expansionism that we've seen for the last three decades. Uh, and so they no longer believed in it. As far as the traditional schools of thought, you had decent Americans, people that had spent their lives working in business, making large amounts of money, donating money to these think tanks. And the think tanks hadn't achieved a single victory in decades. 
you know, the new natural law philosophy. So you're paying these, you're paying these educated elites uh, to spend large amounts of money at black tie dinners, and they're going to write the 5,000th article on property rights or saving the family. All the while, it was obvious to Americans that the family had been in decline, and it seemed like nothing was going to resurrect it. And so they began to question uh, the, uh, the leaders of the Republican Party and whether they seriously meant any of the things that they were saying. While the gods of the right had died, the gods on the left uh, that had been circulating in academia and the bureaucracy were flourishing. And in our next lecture, we'll see the schools of identity politics and how they rose to the fore and eventually would merge with business in the Great Awakening. Mm -hmm.